So we take the first forces and we add them together. I'm going to take the M and replace the A with the G. It's directed downwards, so it's negative. A resistive force, also negative, KMV. I'm going to set equal to the mass times the acceleration, but since we're going to do integration, I'm going to set this equal to the calculus version of A, which is the EV dt. I'm going to say that the KMV is going to be greater than zero because we're not going to have a negative acceleration. Factor out the negative M, then I have GK plus KV. This stays the same. I go ahead and integrate both sides. I get blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Important stuff. Which still doesn't look a lot prettier. Repeat that in English? No. <laughs> I really can't. I can only speak it in math. Basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how it's changing as time. And there's some fancy math to be able to solve it for certain things. But what I wanted to get is what is its velocity at any given time. And I got an equation that shows me that. But now we need to break it down to understand what the heck's going on. It looks much, much worse than it is. Because if we break this down, E, that's a number, it's 2.71, don't you know? <laughs> K, we said earlier, was that resistive constant. T, well, that's a variable. The time is going to be changing from zero time at the beginning to whatever time it hits the ground. K is a constant, C is a constant from integration. K is a constant, G is the gravitational acceleration, constant. And K is a constant. So everything in this equation is constant, which means it's really just a number that if I plugged everything in, I could simplify down a lot. But we don't really want to simplify it, we just want to get an understanding of what it's doing. So let's look at that. This part is what's important first. We have e to the negative kt plus kc. Well, if t gets really large, this kt term is going to be a lot, lot bigger than the kc's term. So we can ignore the kc term. So it's really just going to be e to the negative kt if time gets really, really big. But it's a negative exponent, which means it should really go in the denominator. Which means if it's in the denominator and it gets really big, we can ignore the whole first term. See, I told you it wasn't bad. So all that's really important here is the negative g over k, which is a constant. What's up? Uh, does mass have something to do with that? No, it doesn't. Back up here, the m's were on both sides. And if you have something on both sides of an equation, cancel that out. Oh, right. So no, good question. The mass does not matter. And there's actually a great demonstration of this from the old Apollo footage when they went to the moon. Newton had said a long time ago, the mass doesn't matter. You can take a hammer and a feather, drop them, and if there wasn't some air resistance, it will fall at the exact same rate. During the Apollo missions, they did this on the moon, and sure enough, they fell at the exact same rate. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but let me finish up what I was saying. So when time is really small, when zero, this part's important. When it gets big, it's not, and all that's important is this. So it starts off with this important, but levels off to this. Let's look at that as a graph, it'll make more sense. In other words, you start off with that resistive force not being important, and then it levels off. This is called terminal velocity, something you don't talk about in an airport. <laughs> the thing about this is, as you notice, mass is not part of it, so the blocks that they were walking around on in Advent Children or the bars that Mario was trying to jump off, will fall at the exact same rate as each other. So if this one, the block starts falling first, Mario will have the exact same curve, he'll approach it, but he'll never actually catch up with its velocity. He would be doomed to remain behind it. That's not gonna work too well for him. So the good question was, what about the air resistance? Isn't that gonna be more important? Because Cloud and Sephiroth and Mario are falling straight up and down, but the blocks have a lot more surface area to resist. Yes, that will make a difference, but a very small one, and as soon as they try to take one step, Newton's other laws are gonna apply. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. They take the step, they push the block down and themselves upwards, and now they're not taking the second step. So that will not work in Advent Children. But let's look at my animation again to see how it's really going to look in that. So, Bowser kidnaps Luigi, Mario rushes on the scene to save David, Bowser flies off in the sky. Fortunately, bars start falling from the sky. Mario... <laughs> <laughs> so it's not going to work because Mario can't catch up to the bars to actually step on them. And it wouldn't work for Cloud or Sephiroth either. So anytime you see people jumping off stuff in anime, doesn't work. <laughs> Let's try something a little easier. How many people have seen Gurren Lagann? Oh, good. When I first did this segment, like no one had seen Gurren Lagann yet, so this is good. But I'll show a clip again of it. And this one doesn't have sound. 
All right, so first we're zooming out. We got a planet, we got a solar system, a uh, bigger part of the solar system. Oh my gosh, it's a galaxy. An exploding galaxy? <laughs> no, that's a giant map. The size of a galaxy. The size of a galaxy. Oh my gosh, he's standing on a galaxy. <laughs> so what's wrong with this one? Well, I looked at that and said, Mr. Al, how many galaxies will it take to make that thing? And that's uh, what my question is here, is how many galaxies would it take to build something like that? So I'm going to go through some math to try and figure it out. First off, I want to start with something I kind of know how much stuff is in it. So I started with just a car. Kind of a car and a mech totally have like the same kind of area of kind of metal and empty space, I'm imagining, because you know, car has like the blank space behind the trunk and over the hood, and then a lot inside. So I kind of figure it was close, maybe, to what you expect for a mech. So I'm going to scale that up. We're going to talk about things on the scales of galaxies, so I want to compare a car to a galaxy. A car is roughly 5 meters in length, which is 5.3 times 10 to the negative 16th light years. Yeah. Alright, let me, let me say that in English. Cars are small, galaxies are big. Uh -huh. Thank you. So, in comparison, a galaxy is 100,000 light years across. That means it takes light 100,000 years to get from one side to another at the speed of light, which is 3 million meters every second. Or if you want to hear that another way, then the sun is 93 million miles away. It takes over eight minutes for light to get from here to there. So yeah, light moves fast, but not that fast on the scale of galaxies. But that's only for the length of a car. What about the height and width? Well, we can repeat that. Um, so the galaxy is ten, two times 10 to the 20th times the length of the car. So if we want to scale that up, that's the thing we're going to multiply by. Repeating that for the others, we can get factors for that. And putting it all together to get a volume, we get the volume of galaxies 2.1 times 10 to the 58th times larger than a car. That's kind of big, but I'm sure a lot of people aren't cool with scientific notation. Yeah? It is, but that doesn't mean we're creating new galaxies. So we're only concerned about what matter we have available. Right? So some big number, but let's try to get an idea of what that actually means. We don't want to talk about just the mass. We want to talk about some single component of it. I figure the mech's got to be made out of steel somewhere, but steel is 95% iron, so let's scale up how much iron there should be in a car by that 10 to the 58 factor we just looked at. So let's multiply that together. Uh, putting this in kilograms, that would be 730 kilograms of iron in a car. Multiplying it together, you need 1.5 times 10 to the 61 kilograms of iron. If you can't remember scientific notation, that means I need to move the decimal point to the right 61 places. That's like billion, 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 billion kilograms of iron. That's a lot. Again, let's put that in context. Uh, the mass of a single galaxy is only 1.9 times 10 to the 43rd kilogram, so we are going to need 7.9 times 10 to the 17th galaxies to make up the same mass, just to make up the weight of it. There's one small problem with this. How many people have heard of this thing? The Hubble Space Telescope. Yay! Good. Back in 1999, it did this big survey where what it did is it looked at a tiny portion of the sky, the area of Roosevelt's eye on a dime held at arm's length, and it just stared at it. And they chose this spot because there was nothing there, nothing at all. And they wanted to look at it for a long, long time and just let the light collect and collect and see if there was actually something there that they hadn't seen before. And when they put the image together, this is what they found. Thousands and thousands of galaxies at the edge of like the observable universe, when the universe was only a billion years old. Everything you see in this picture that you can't see because this screen is kind of dimly lit is a galaxy. Hundreds of millions of stars. Thousands of galaxies. But we can take this. We say, okay, there's this many galaxies in an area this big. What if I took that and spread that out over the whole sky? How many galaxies should there be? So this Hubble estimate in 1999 was that there's 1.25 times 10 to the 11 galaxies in the entire universe. Now, how many galaxies did we just require? It turns out you need 6.3 times 10 to the 6 universes to make that mech. But that's not where it ends. 
Remember, we were just talking about mass, but what we really are really wanting to be concerned about is the iron. So how much iron's in a single galaxy? 0.001%. Iron is really, really rare. Hydrogen and helium make up 98% of our universe. Everything else is that tiny 2%, and iron is a tiny piece of that tiny percent. So we need to scale this up to account for just how little iron there is in the universe, which means we need six and a third billion universes, universes, to get that much iron. So if you remember the show, the whole reason that they were fighting the spiral enemies is because they were trying to, uh, for, or the spiral nemesis was trying to stop them, was to prevent the spiral nemesis, which would destroy the universe. Well, it turns out that that doesn't really matter because to make their mechs, they're destroying billions of universes anyway. So who's the real bad guy here? Not who you think. So that kind of turns that show around. Very good. For my next topic, I want to look at something out of Cowboy Bebop. Because everybody loves Cowboy Bebop. Yeah! This uh, episode was from the uh, Heavy Metal Queen. Yeah, great episode. They're all great. My floating act. All right. So for those that haven't seen this episode, what's going on in there is that they're trapped in an empty like mine shaft inside an asteroid. It has no air in it, and the tunnel entrance or exit has been blocked by a whole bunch of rubble. And there's some explosive next to it, but they have nothing that they can really do about it. So Spike takes his little pod, he sets it on autopilot, says, go crash into the explosives and blow it up. But he can't dock with another ship to get out, so he just pops the hatch, jumps out in the curve vacuum over to another ship, which opens the door and says, sure, come on in. I think you can probably expect that jumping out in a vacuum is probably not a good idea, but how bad of an idea is it? Well, there's... Oops. Um, two main things you need to worry about, and that's explosive decompression and vacuum conditions. And during the testing for the Apollo missions, there was a whole bunch of ton tests done with spacesuits, and one time something went wrong, so I want to show a video of what happens if you get exposed to a vacuum, and just how quickly things go bad. And this one's kind of long too, but I think it's really interesting, so I'm going to let it go. But the ultimate and most dangerous test was a huge, specially constructed vacuum chamber. They were able to pull all the air out, create a big vacuum, just like it would be on the moon. That way we could test our suits to make sure there was no leakage. One such test narrowly avoided disaster. Jim LeBlanc was the test subject in the vacuum chamber. Cliff Hess, the supervising engineer outside. Jim, while you're exercising, I'd like you to stay convenient all the time. Okay, I'm pretty cool right now. Okay, well, you'll warm up here in a minute, so let's stay right here if you can stand it. The testing started just normally, like they all do. Uh, and Jim was out of vacuum in his spacesuit. Well, I feel pretty good. With all the air sucked out, all that protected him was his pressurized suit. Then, something happened. I heard over the headset that he was losing suit pressure. The tube pressurizing his suit had become disconnected. He was in serious danger. It really wasn't any fuel. It was just happening so fast, you know, trying to get the chamber back to a safe pressure, and Jim to a safe pressure inside the suit. As I stumbled backwards, I could feel the slime on my tongue starting to bubble just before I went unconscious. And that's kind of the last thing I remember. Uh, essentially, he had no pressure on the outside of his body. And that's a very unusual case to get, and there's very little in this medical literature as to what happens when you have that. There's a lot of conjecture, you know, that your fluids are warm. Within 25 seconds, a co-worker, sitting in a partially pressurized antechamber and wearing an oxygen mask, was able to dash in. 
At the normal rate of repressurization, it would have taken 30